up here. Let's do 2022 uh, macro question number one. Let's see if we can make sense of this. All right. Uh, to assume a country's economy is operating below full employment. Anytime you see operating below full employment, we know this is a recession. That's just how they're always going to say it, or that's the way they say it a lot. Is you're just going to say, try to be code for you there, operating below full employment. Don't let them trick you. Uh, if you are operating above full employment, that would be inflation. Operating below full employment is a recession. So they want us to draw this graph with aggregate demand, short run, long run, aggregate supply. Current equilibrium, where we're at right now in a recession, output and price, W1, PL1, and full employment, WF. So we're just going to draw a nice little graph here. Price level on the vertical, real GDP on the horizontal. Long run aggregate supply. Notice which I'm drawing first here is I'm drawing my long run aggregate supply curve first. Then I'm going to draw my upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve. Every so often on these exams, they're going to tell you that short run aggregate supply curve is upward sloping. Don't let that confuse you or bother you. They're just giving you extra information that you don't really need. So we know our short run. If they told you their short run aggregate supply curve was not upward sloping, then that would be weird and strange, and you'd have to flip your thinking to some Keynesian stuff. But right now, uh, we know what this is. We're also then going to draw in our aggregate demand curve. Now, notice I drew my aggregate demand curve to the left of my where they come together. This is my current equilibrium. It is to the left of long run aggregate supply. Full employment is right here. That's where YF is. Right under your long run aggregate supply is always full employment. Since our current economy is right here, we'll call this, I think, Y1, Y1, and PL1. This shows that we're in a recession. Our aggregate demand has slid to the left of full employment. So easy enough, that's done. Uh, B, identify one fiscal policy action that the country's government can take to restore full employment. Well, when they say fiscal policy, we know that means government. We know there's only two things the government can do. They can do government spending or taxes. In this situation, they want to increase government spending or reduce taxes. Either one of those is going to make aggregate demand go up or shift to the right. right? So either one of these would have been perfect and lovely for what they're looking for. Government spending goes up or taxes go down. Easy enough. Uh, C, assume instead that there's no fiscal policy action is taken. Suppose a change in investment spending causes real GDP to increase by $200 billion. Calculate the minimum change in investment spending that would have caused this increase in real GDP if the marginal propensity to save is 0.25. As soon as I saw this, I kind of know what's going on. If we've done enough of these MPC and MPS questions, we know what they're asking here. They're saying that GDP is going to increase by $200 billion. I know that we have our MPC and our MPS, marginal propensity to consume, marginal propensity to save. Whatever, if your MPC is point, or MPS is 0.25, these two always have to equal 1. So if this is 0.25, this has to be 0.75. Add those together, you get one. So when they gave me my MPS, really, that's all I needed. <coughs> Sorry. That's all I really needed was that MPS. Usually, they're being a little tricky here. Usually, they're going to give you the MPC. You figure out the MPS. Then you have to figure out what the multiplier is. Now, the multiplier is either 1 over the MPS or 1 over 1 minus the MPC. These are the same things, so don't get confused. I tend to just put this in my brain because I'm simple like that. I'm not going to be complicated. I mean, I, this isn't complicated, but this is what I keep in my brain. I know what's going on. So 1 over 0.25. Now, recognize that next year, 2023 or this year, since I'm doing it, uh, we're running into the 2022-23 school year. Uh, they can give you calculators, or you will be using calculators. So this isn't going to be quite so simple anymore. I'm sure they're going to make it more complicated. 
So 1 divided by 0.25 is going to give us 4, and this is what we call our multiplier. Our multiplier is 4. So investment spending caused real GDP to increase by $200 billion. $200 billion was what VA GDP went up. Now, we know our multiplier was 4, so the question is, what was investment times 4 to give us a $200 billion increase in real GDP? Obviously, fairly simple math here. Don't expect it next year. 50 times 4, $200 billion real GDP. Do you see how we did that? Now, they do want you to show your work, so you're going to have to show them how you got those numbers. Just walk your way through it. Give them all the information you can. Make sure they understand how you figured it out. All right, D. Assume that the output gap was initially, though, $800 billion. On your graph in Part A, here in Part A, show the short-run effect of the change in investment spending in Part C. Labeling any weekly moon graph is Y2, output is Y2, and the new price level is PL2. So all they're asking you to do here, this gap, your initial output gap, is the distance between these two, let's say Y1 and YF. If Y1 is our current equilibrium and YF is full employment, we have an $800 billion gap there. Now, what we know is investment spending only went up by $200 billion. So there's no way we closed an $800 billion gap with only $200 billion increase in real GDP. Now, what they mean when they say an $800 billion output gap, they mean that we needed $800 billion of real GDP increase to close to get us back to full employment, right? We would have moved to right there if we would have had 800 billion. Instead, we didn't. So what we recognize is that we only got a little, we only got a 200 billion increase in real GDP. So what happened here was actually we only moved to right there. Our aggregate demand definitely increased, but it did not close the gap still in a recession. This would be, let's say, PL2. There's Y1. Let's call that Y2. I know it gets a little sloppy here on the small board, but I think we can figure out what's going on. We didn't give a full 800 billion increase. We only had 200 billion, so we couldn't get back to full employment. Still in a recession. All right. E, and that's all they wanted there, was to show, let's say that's AD1, that's AD2, to show that aggregate demand shifted to the right, but it did not get back to full employment. Given your answer to Part D, is the actual rate of unemployment greater than, less than, or equal to your natural rate? Now, this again is code. What we know is, if your actual rate of unemployment, let's just use U, equals your natural rate of unemployment, and this is what we call full employment, right? We are at full employment if the actual rate of unemployment equals our natural rate, okay? Here they're saying we know we're in a recession, so we have to have, since we're in a recession, would you think there'd be more unemployment or less unemployment at the natural rate than the natural rate? So if we're in a recession, we know that our actual rate has to be greater than our natural rate of unemployment. This is going to give us a recession. Now, this is confusing. You have to write this out a few times. Make sure you understand it. Because we know where full employment is. We know we're on this side of it. We know that's called a recession. Therefore, we know we have to have more unemployment than our natural rate. Our actual rate of unemployment is greater than the natural rate. And I've kind of beaten that to death, but they ask it a lot. So spend some time. Make sure you understand what's going on. The other thing to know here is if your actual unemployment rate is less than your natural rate of unemployment you are in an inflationary scenario, right? Either inflationary gap, inflationary, whatever. Yeah, E, however they say it, and I like to say it every different kind of way just to be tricky. But know these. This is language that they use all the time. You need to know it. Uh, so here we are with our recession, our actual rate of unemployment greater than our natural rate. Therefore, we're still in a recession, and that's exactly how you would explain it. All right, number F. Assume the private savings now increases, so people are saving more to draw a correctly labeled graph, the loanable funds market, right? 
and show the effect of an increase in private savings on the real interest rate. Now that's telling you sometimes you might forget what the loanable funds graph looks like. It is a supply of loanable funds curve, demand for loanable funds. You don't have to do the DLF or the SLF. I do it just because I'm a child and I do things the same way all the time. That way I don't have to think. My brain just pulls it out. Real interest rate on the vertical. Real interest rate on the vertical right there, right? Quantity of loanable funds. People are saving more money. Now, the way we're going to think about our loanable funds graph here. Oops. Did that go? Yep. Loanable funds graph. Is it's just money? Money in the banks. That's the way we want to think about our loanable funds. So if this is representing money in the banks and people are saving more money, well, where are they putting their money? We would assume either they're putting it in the mattress or they're putting it in the banks. You and I are going to assume they're just putting more money in the banks so we know our supply of loanable funds shifts to the right. More money, this is an increase in supply of loanable funds. If there's more money in the banks, we can assume that the interest rate is going to fall. We go from real interest rate one to real interest rate two. We want to show an arrow going down. And then here you just need to fill in Q1, Q2. This is what's important here. They're looking for and the shifting of the supply of loanable funds curve. QLF, Q, whatever. Just fill in. Make sure your axes are labeled so that we can't take any points away from you. All right. We recognize that the supply of loanable funds has increased. The real interest rate has fallen. I think we're good. I don't think we need to do anything else with that. Now, G says based solely on the change in the real interest rate. What we know is our real interest rate. Let's do it right here. Our real interest rate went down. What's that going to do to real GDP in the short run? Well, we should know from back in aggregate demand and aggregate supply that anytime interest rates fall, people are going to want to take out more loans. And that should make sense to you. Would you rather take out a loan at 20% or 2%? Most people would say, I'd rather take Charles a loan when the interest rate goes down to 2%. So if interest rates fall, what we know is investment, which we're going to think of as people taking out loans and building factories and capital and equipment and machinery, etc. People are going to have, there's going to be more investment as interest rates go down. So as there's more investment, we know that's going to kick aggregate demand up. Or there's no aggregate demand. Right? If investment goes up, aggregate demand goes up. Aggregate demand goes up, real GDP goes up. Now, you would want to write these out. Don't just use arrows like I did. This is sort of the short way for you to remember it and understand it. And then you simply, the college board's pretty easy on this. Real interest rates are falling, therefore people are going to take out more loans, they're going to buy more stuff, investment goes up, consumption goes up, capital goods are produced. When capital goods are produced or more investment or more consumption, aggregate demand increases. When aggregate demand increases, we know real GDP is going to increase, and we can call this a run or uh, number two says long-run aggregate supply. Now these, there's a number of these just about every other year. Um, we answer them the same way every time I do, like a child. As soon as I know what's happening to the real interest rate, and I know that real interest rate is going down, I know that investment is going to go up. I know that capital, as soon as there's more investment of people taking out loans, I can assume there's going to be more capital formation. This is just capital goods, equipment, machinery, tools, etc., factories, right? As soon as there's more investment due to those lower interest rates, businesses are going to want to take out and build more loans or build more capital goods. So there's more investment. Capital formation increases. Therefore, your long-run aggregate supply curve would shift to the right is the way we'd like to say that. Now, they could also, this is what changes. This section, part of the question doesn't tend to change too often. This changes, though. We could have said our long-run aggregate supply curve shifts to the right. We could have also said our PPC shifts out. These are both correct. We would want to be specific here with this question, but 
They could also have asked you what happened to economic growth. We should recognize that economic growth and the PPC and the long run aggregate supply, these two curves are the same curves and economic growth is just a representation of what's going on with these two curves. So economic growth increased, PPC shifted out, long run aggregate supply curve shifted to the right. Every so often, they could say something like what happened to potential output. I'd want you to know it. Would that be the first thing that came to mind that I think about? No, but they have asked this before. Same question. They just call it potential output. Potential output is that sort of where the best place we can be on our PPC when it shifts out. So don't worry too much about that. Recognize what's going on here and understand how to answer this. The answer is the same for all of these questions. The only thing that changes is how they're going to ask you what happens. All right, guys, I think that's it. That was uh, fairly dense. Seems like they're getting denser every year, and I expect it to be a little more challenging with the calculators next year. So, all right, good luck. If you need any help, I'm on Wyzant, W-Y, that's your spelling. Some of you guys probably know that one. And you're just looking for Charles W. I'll help you out. All right, be safe, take care.